this uh, Zoom so everybody knows. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Efren, for being here. Efren Garcia, class of 2009, uh, currently holds the title of paid social lead at Spotify. Um, and I am going to get out of the way and hand it over to Efren. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Hey everyone, my name is Efren. Um, attended Oneonta from 2005 to 2009. Go Red Dragons. Um, yeah, and happy, happy to be on here today. Um, should I just dive into my career trajectory from Oneonta? And <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I came to Oneonta first to play Division I soccer, which was great. Um, I am one of the last members of the D1 men's soccer team. Um, at Oneonta State. It's D3 now, as you guys know, but there was a time when it was D1, um, and that's when I joined Oneonta. Um, my first, my first, uh, I switched majors. I hate to say this, but I switched majors actually two or three times <laughs> at Oneonta. I was still trying to find myself, but um, I started in major in, in the music industry. I was my first major, um, and back in the day, I wanted to be the next Clive Davis. I wanted to be able to scout um, the next talent and, and find the find the people hidden on the streets playing in the guitar um, and bring them to top record labels. Um, that was my dream in the beginning. My dream quickly changed. Music industry was great. The program and the staff were amazing. Um, but then I went into computer graphics or graphic design. Um, and I was kind of self-taught there. So I thought I learned a lot there already. And I switched one last time um, to comp studies. And I, and I finally graduated Oneonta with a communication studies degree. Um, after college, it was great. Best four years of my life. I love Oneonta. Um, I actually was an admissions counselor at Oneonta after I graduated for, for a couple of years as well, or as actually probably a year, um, as well. So I stayed living in Oneonta. I'm from Rockland County, but I stayed up there, um, and became an admissions counselor and did some tours there, which was great as well. After I left admissions counseling <laughs> at Oneonta, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and it's okay. Like I'm here to say that that's okay. Um, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do because I definitely did not. Um, the one thing I quickly went over um, or skipped over, but I probably shouldn't have, was that I was also a professional gamer in college, um, and I was very very lucky there because I was on a full time salary um, from sophomore to senior year. So when I graduated college, I necessarily I didn't really have to figure it out at that point because I was a professional gamer. Um, and I was getting paid a full-time salary to just game, which was great. Um, and this is before Twitch days, guys. This is like back in the day when it was a little bit older. Um, so it was it was quite fun. Um, the money wasn't incredible, but it was still a full-time salary. Um, so I got I had some time after college to just sit around and, and try to figure it out after gaming was over. And once gaming ended, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, and I feel like it's okay if you're there. Um, that's where I was for a very long time. Um, but at the same time, digital marketing was, was booming. And that's when I met a good friend, Chad, who was my mentor at the time. Um, and I just begged him. He was the head of um, SEO or SEM at a company called SeatGeek in New York City. Um, they're still around. They're still big. Uh, they're essentially like a ticket master um, for, you know, but they use analytics. It's, it's a little bit more advanced than Ticketmaster. Um, and it was a great company. And I begged him to teach me everything he knew about internet marketing um, for free. And I was like, just teach me anything you want. I want to learn everything. You're the best that I know at this stuff. And I just want to learn everything from you. So I begged him to take me in for an internship in New York City. He did. Um, and the next month and a half, I got to shadow him every single day and learned everything from him. This was years ago. Um, and I was supposed to stay there for, for three or four months. And after a month and a half, I had learned so much that I could apply in the real world from him. Um, that I received three or four job offers in a month and a half um, to be an inter to internet marketing strategist, which was great. Um, after that, I took my first real job after admissions counseling. I took my first real job in internet marketing in New Jersey at a company called Hudson Horizons. Um, we worked with very small, small businesses, um, small to medium sized businesses, just running their social media presences um, and running their advertising campaigns, just trying to get more customers in the door trying to get them more awareness. I was there for two and a half years and took my first real job in New York City um, at an internet marketing agency called Movement Strategy. That's where I became, I think, um, my interest for paid social, um, which is essentially just advertising on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter um, for businesses. That's what we call paid social in the performance marketing industry. Um, at Movement Strategy in New York City, we got to work with 
all the New York sports teams, Knicks, Rangers, Nets, uh, New York City FC. We had to work with some global airlines, um, Latam Airlines. We had to work with True TV, Smithsonian TV, USA Today, some pretty big brands. Um, and it was there where I honed my skills in paid social. Um, I was the only guy doing it at the agency at the time. Um, I got to manage multi-million dollar budgets every single month. Um, and it was fantastic. It was a great learning experience because when you have that much budget to spend, um, you get to run as many tests as you want and gain as many learnings as you want. Um, so that's that allowed me to really, really grow in the industry. I was at Move a Strategy for two years. And then this is a bit timely now, um, not so much back then, but I became the first global acquisition marketing manager for a company uh, called WeWork. Um, WeWork is making headlines now and they have been in the past. Um, there was just a documentary released about WeWork on Hulu, uh, the rise and fall of the $47 billion valuation of that company. Um, if you guys haven't seen it yet, um, just know that it's pretty accurate. Uh, I, know, I know a lot of Hollywood um, documentaries seem to over-exaggerate, but the WeWork story is pretty accurate from that documentary. I was there for 50% of it and I could attest to it. Um, but I was the first acquisition marketing manager for WeWork. Um, I was responsible for building out their global paid social strategy for the entire company. I was the first guy there to do it. Um, and that was a really good experience. Uh, and then until it wasn't, because if you guys don't know, you guys can read the WeWork story, but WeWork got dark pretty fast. Um, and I actually decided to leave WeWork with nothing lined up. Um, it, it, just, it just became that bad and that toxic. Um, but lucky for me, in the two weeks notice that I gave at WeWork, I was there for two years, in the two weeks notice that I gave at WeWork, um, I was asked to speak on a panel for paid social and on that panel was Spotify. And the next day, the recruiter from Spotify reached out after the panel. So the rest is history. I've been at Spotify for, for three and a half years now. And um, that's where I'll stay for a very long time running paid social. Um, at Spotify, I lead a team of four um, I run global acquisition campaigns for Spotify's free and premium business. It's a very, very large budget. Our job is essentially to use social media advertising to get new users to download the app and new users to sign up for Spotify premium. And that's where I am today. So that was the long roundabout story of getting to Spotify. Um, it's funny because I, I wanted to be in the music industry when I attended Oneonta. Um, and I indirectly got there, um, even though I didn't necessarily have a music industry degree. So just wanted to call that out that it's okay if you don't know what you're going to do now. Um, but that's, that's where I was. And that's how I got here today. Ethan, thank you. That, um, that is a journey <laughs> in, in nine, I guess, 11, about 11 years, 12 years now. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely a long journey and I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I knew I liked, I love social media at some point. Um, and I started from the organic perspective at agency and worked my way in house to the paid side, which is something I'm, I'm really, really happy about and really happy about where I am today. Well, um, I know it's always scary to be the first person to ask a question. <laughs> um, and I see, uh, I won't, I won't call anybody out, although there are a few brave souls with their videos on, which I appreciate. Um, but does anyone have a question for Ephraim that you'd like to ask about his time at Oneonta or um, his work at Spotify or um, WeWork or um, Hudson Horizons, any of the other um, uh, ladder rungs that uh, got him to where he is today? Well, I have a question then. <laughs> you can go first. I'm pretty, I, they always say that I'm pretty transparent about working um, and work-life balance. Um, they call me the best boss at Spotify. So <laughs> if you guys have any questions at all, anything, um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty open to talk about it, but go ahead. Sure, so for, um, for someone coming, coming out of college, if you're looking to hire um, a, a new member of your team, what types of skills or personal characteristics or traits are you really looking for? Um, uh, paid social in the world of uh, advertising and marketing is still semi new as, as compared with, you know, direct mail and things that have been around for centuries. Um, so what are those 
traits or what are those experiences or skills that you really want to see from a candidate? Hunger to be taught. <laughs> um, the thing about paid social is it's different for every single company. Um, like how we run paid social on Spotify was not the way we ran it at WeWork, was not the way we ran it at USA Today and True TV. Um, so the first thing we want is somebody who knows that it's going to be changing. It's an ever-changing landscape. Um, paid social, especially Facebook, it's, it's an absolute beast. There's a lot of regulations coming out now. Um, Cambridge Analytica was just the start of it, but now there's so many more regulations coming, especially with Apple updates um, and privacy updates. So the first thing is a desire to, to learn um, how we're running paid social at Spotify and, and adapt. Um, and of course, you know, I'd be remiss to say if, hey, if we didn't want to have somebody with campaign building experience, so somebody who's built Facebook campaigns before, um, and knows what objectives matter, and what metrics matter would be great. But again, like those things can be taught pretty easily. Um, but a desire, a desire to learn is, is something we definitely look for. Does anybody have any Facebook campaign building experience or ads building experience? Uh, oh. Not on. Oh, oh go ahead. Sorry. Not on Facebook specifically, but um, I do uh, Amazon campaigns for um, different like merch releases and even like past tour merch that's just like come back around because it's like sitting in a warehouse. We might as well throw it on Amazon, uh, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, see, I, I would say that you're even further advanced than a lot of people. I think e-commerce advertising is, the skills for e-commerce advertising, especially on Amazon, is something we look for at Spotify. I think that's that's somebody who we call them ads ninjas, but um, that's some that's something the optimization involved in getting a lower cost per sale um, is something that we value at Spotify. So somebody like that, you know, that's great experience to have. What are you what are you selling? Is it just apparel or um, mostly apparel? But um, just totally depends on the artist because I'm I'm at Universal Music Group, so um, some artists have like full collections or it might have like slippers and um knickknacks and things like that but others it's like just t-shirts or it might just be like print on demand merch so really just depends on the account but um yeah like like you said it's mostly just about finding like the best returns and kind of balancing that with all of the other acts so some might return like ten dollars um on average for every dollar and then you have to balance that with the one that's just um returning three, you know, but we need to get rid of, <laughs> get this merge out of here because it's just costing us money. So yeah, uh, definitely Op that bad. optimization is a big part of our job as well. Um, we do it on a global scale. So we definitely use some tools, um, FMPs or Facebook marketing partners to help us scale um, that budget as well and optimize the way we need to, to ensure that we're getting a, a good return on ad spend. But yeah. that's, that's great experience. Mm -hmm. It definitely seems like a skill that's going to be needed, like oh yeah, in the next <laughs> few years. Like, oh yeah, because um, especially with um, at least Apple's like taking steps to um, like the whole data scandal thing about them like maybe selling data, maybe not. Um, it's like now there needs to be a new approach to collecting data, or at least knowing who your customers are. If you can't like. Um, get an email just from them like clicking on your site or your Facebook pixel or that something like that so um just knowing how to run digital ads without like collecting data without people knowing that you're collecting data is definitely going to be um, really important for the next few years at least for sure and I just want to call out guys if, if anybody's ever seen an ad on Facebook or Twitter from Spotify it's I'm the guy who's sending it to you um, which is pretty interesting. And if you get to Spotify and you don't sign up for my app, you're getting retargeted. And if you get to Spotify and you don't sign up for premium, you're getting retargeted. Um, and that's me using the data from our website and creating an audience of people who didn't take a purchase on our site and sending you another ad. Uh, so sorry in advance, um, that's my job, um, but it actually retargeting actually works pretty well. It's a lower cost per purchase for us. Um, so just know that if you see a Spotify ad, it's, it's me and my team. So Ephraim, I'm, I'm guessing you may be in conversations with colleagues or family or friends or just anyone. 
um, data is such a sensitive topic right now and, and the acquisition of personal data. Um, and anyone who uses a computer or is on the internet knows that some amount of information is being collected. So what is, um, what's Spotify's or what's your response? Um, because I, I personally think that there are um, ethical and unethical ways to use data. So what's, what's your response and where's Spotify stand on the use of personal data that's um, collected through social media or other personal activity on the web? And um, it did, uh, did considering the ways companies use data at all influence where you wanted to work and the work that you wanted to do? That last, so I was going to answer your question and the last question was very interesting. Um, I, I don't think kind of, I mean, I, I almost had an opportunity to join Facebook that I turned down. Um, and this was during the time of Cambridge Analytica. Um, there's, that was the biggest scandal, how, you know, they were infiltrating groups on Facebook with Russian propaganda. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into politics. That's all, that's as far as I'm going to go. Um, and I think that was a time when Facebook was looking to bring on someone like me and I turned down um, the opportunity to join Facebook then. That's probably the only time I think like data privacy came in to mind when I was picking a, picking a career path or choosing a career path. I will say at Spotify, we use app data, um, how you browse the app, and I'll be super candid, like how you browse the app, what you listen to, um, all to better your experience. We have the best data privacy team in the world. Some campaigns that we run has to go through legal. Um, actually, a lot of campaigns that we run has to go through legal for sign off. Um, we've been called out. That doesn't mean we're not like Facebook. You know, We've been called out for data privacy concerns as well. Um, and we've had to adapt to that. We've had to make changes to that. For me, I think data privacy is the most important thing. I think, especially now and today, um, in today's climate, I think that we need to be like Spotify and, and not even just Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, um, Amazon, we all need to be um, able to abide by, by, private, by data privacy and, and do the right thing. Um, I think that, look, I mean, <laughs> Spotify, the controversial thing on Spotify is Joe Rogan. I know, I think, I think some people have seen public, uh, public articles about that and, you know, we have town halls every month at Spotify. We discuss these things as a company um, and anybody can go. It doesn't matter if you're entry level at Spotify or you're on the D team at Spotify, um, you know, the, the C-level execs. You can ask any question you want. And I think that the most controversial thing was Joe Rogan recently um, on our platform. And I think that a lot of, not just users of Spotify, but employees at Spotify were like, this is it. Like, I'm not working at Spotify if you go through with this anymore. Uh, with Joe Rogan. And, you know, I didn't, I'm not as, that's not who I am. I mean, I love my experience at Spotify, so I don't think that was enough for me to leave. Um, but I think that there were concerns about data privacy and Joe Rogan, things like Joe Rogan, um, that make you question your integrity, right? That make you say whether or not you want to stay at a company. Um, several things have happened throughout the world, um, and I'm still happy to be at Spotify. Um, but data privacy is the number one thing that, that Spotify gets spoken about a lot now. Um, and it's something that we abide with pretty well. So just know like when we're running campaigns or anything that we have to do that, that might even invade privacy, um, there's a huge legal process that goes behind it. And Spotify, in my opinion, has one of the best data privacy teams in the world. Thanks, Ephraim. And I, I was in no, um, no way trying to um, hate on Spotify. It's actually the, the app that I use for all of my <laughs> music. So, um, <laughs> so I was just curious to get your perspective on that. For sure. Any other questions? Let's hit me, you guys. Hit me with the questions. I'm, I'm an open book. I have a question. Hi, um, I'm Abby. I'm the president of the Music Industry Club at Oneonta. Um, and I also, um, like, I want to be like an artist manager. And so I'm managing a couple like small like student artists. And I have like a big, like, I'm always like debating how to like, have a social media presence for them, I guess. So I wonder, like, do you have any tips for like, how to like show your personality, but also like promote yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to try to answer it 
the way I think is best. Um, I left organic community management and organic social media um, a long time ago, and I'm very happy I did um, because this is very hard to do what you're saying, um, especially if you're a new artist and, and a rising artist. Um, the best thing I'll say is, well, you asked two questions. The first part of your question was all, was organic and the second part was paid, like promoting yourself. Um, the best thing I'll say is just let the music speak for itself, be authentic um, on social media, use a lot, a lot of uh, Instagram photos, things like that. Um, make sure that when you're on Instagram using the right hashtags for those artists, um, it's, it's very important to use the hashtags on Instagram as well, the ones that are trending. Are very important. We use tools. I know there. Are, I know at social the social media team at Spotify uses tools to identify trending hashtags before they even trend. Um, and there's a lot of content around those things as well. So the content's very. It's it's scripted in a way where it knows it's going to get the most engagement, um, but it's authentic way of using the artist to put to put it out there. Um, so for the organic side, make sure you have a good social con like a community calendar. Um, like a content calendar to post things quite often, respond to every comment um, and tweet you get. Um, even if you don't get anything, engage with the top uh, music industry um, accounts as well so that their followers can see that you're engaging with them. Um, and also, yeah, let the music speak for itself, get the music front and center so people can hear. On the paid side, that's organic side, on the paid side, there's so many things you can do. It just depends on your budget. Um, if, you're, if they have websites, um, paid social is great for that, for the, for driving traffic. Facebook also has, um, snippets on the inside. So you can, you can include their sound, their, their SoundCloud or Spotify links, uh, within Facebook ads as well. So that a user who is seeing it for the first time could listen right away. Um, so paid, paid has a lot more opportunity. Um, obviously not a lot of these artists have big budgets, um, but you don't need a big budget if your target audience is right. Um, so make sure you know what similar artists are um, in that genre and target their fans as well and you should get some clicks. I'm, I'm happy to like, if you want to connect on LinkedIn, I'm definitely happy to talk a little bit more about this as well. I'm a, I'm a, I have a lot of paid social ideas for that. Okay, cool. Yeah, that definitely helps. I always, I'm always like, I don't want to like pay to like promote a post because I feel like that can look like corny sometimes. Like when I'm like scrolling and I see people promote, but like if it helps, it helps. So yeah, organic, the thing about Facebook is organic reach is dying. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before. Um, Facebook is becoming a pay to play. There's too many advertisers right now for organic content to be seen. Um, that doesn't mean it's impossible to be seen. It's like the only thing is that you really, really have to work at it to be seen a lot longer. Um, and how the algorithms work is, you know, you'll start with maybe like, we'll call it, if you're lucky, 3% of your fans will see your content organically. Um, it's lower than that today. It's definitely lower. Um, and if you don't have strong engagement on all of your social media content, then that number just keeps getting lower and lower and lower um, to a point where you're now reaching less than 1% of your fans on Facebook. Um, so it's, I totally understand that like, it may look um, non-authentic by promoting a post, but really that's the only way to get in front of the target audience you need to convert. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Of course. So hi, Fran. I know we've uh, emailed a little bit. It's nice to see you hey. in person. Thank you so much for being here. The information you're sharing is, is super helpful to the students. I mean, everybody wants to know how to handle a, a social media campaign online. So I know too, you know, I've, I've wandered around Facebook a little bit too. I think there's so many great tools in there too. And sort of the, what do they call it? The looks like you know your fans and then who your fans who do they look like how i'm curious how you know that works with spotify i think it's gary his last name begins with a k he's a big social media guy but he was talking about how inexpensive facebook ads are now that it's like the least expensive way to advertise and everybody should be on facebook advertising so just curious a little bit more about some of the details in your job I'd love for you to share a little bit more about corporate culture. You know, you talked about the town hall. I know that there's like a performance every Friday afternoon that's working at a tech company is certainly way different than working for a record label. And then you touched on a skill set and characteristics when Ben asked you, you know, being flexible and understanding that your job is going to be constantly changing. But what are some of the technical skills that you look for? And I'm curious what the 
I, I could just ask a million questions, but like how many years of experience do you typically think someone needs before they can enter your department and what would be a path they could take to get there? Wow, thank you for asking those questions. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. I might have to take a second. I actually wrote down the questions one by one because I didn't know if I'd capture it all. Um, the first question is about the Facebook advertising capabilities, I think. Um, and also I think you, did you mean Gary Vaynerchuk? Gary V? Right, Gary Vaynerchuk, yeah. Yeah, so Gary V is someone I do not like, but thanks for bringing him up. <laughs> uh, it's totally fine. Um, I don't necessarily like him either, but he's just got some interesting. Yeah, he Gary, says a lot of interesting things. The, the one thing I'll say about Gary is that he is the pioneer of social media and you can't take that away from him. Um, Gary V is very famous. Vayner Media is a very, very big agency in New York City. Um, I recommend if you do want to go into the social media route, it's definitely an agency that you want to start at for your career. Um, I didn't go that route, but I work for a different agency. It's just as, just as great. Um, but it definitely gives you the skills that you need um, what you'll learn in three years, you'll learn in one year at VaynerMedia and Gary's agencies, um, or at any agency in New York City, you learn a lot very fast. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is about Facebook advertising capabilities. Lookalike audiences, as you, as you were calling it, um, what that does is it looks at all the conversions, all the signals that you're getting on your website, um, and it uses Facebook IDs to determine what other interests um, what are the interests of the people that visit your website or convert or purchase on your website um, and tries to match those interests with other users on Facebook that we may not be targeting. Um, that's called lookalike audiences. There's a 1% match, a 3% match, a 5% match, all the way up to a 10% match of that. Um, and what that means is like the 1% of Facebook users, it'll try to match your conversion to us. Um, that's just scratching the surface, the surface of Facebook advertising capabilities. Um, retargeting is very, very powerful. Um, so as I mentioned before, we, not just Spotify, but it's not even Spotify that's doing retargeting well, because we're not, um, in my opinion, but that's okay, because our prospecting, without retargeting, we're doing really well. Um, but companies that really, really get, you know, retargeting done right is our e-commerce companies. So maybe Vershawn, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know your name, but the guy who spoke before um, about Amazon, like those are the companies that really, really get retargeting right. So, you know, if you're adding something to cart, you're getting an email saying that, hey, you left something in your cart. Um, if you're looking at red shoes on Zappos, you're getting a dynamic product ad on Facebook that shows you several other red shoes. Um, those are the companies that really, really get retargeting right. Um, and again, like retargeting and look like audiences in, in the way that we can target on Facebook is just these two things are just scratching the surface. Um, Facebook has a lot of power of reaching its target audience. Um, there's a small business in every single category out there and I can find the user for that small business on Facebook. Um, so that was, that's the first thing. I don't know if that answered your question, but I'm, I'm gonna jump into the corporate culture one next, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, you, you just make me ask, think of more <laughs> things, but Keep going. That was perfect. You can keep, you can keep asking them. Corporate <laughs> culture. I haven't seen corporate culture, like traditional culture, since my admissions counseling days at Oneonta. Um, I, 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 I was an admissions counselor at Oneonta. That's where I wear a shirt and tie every day to work. Um, that was great. Don't get me wrong. Like I loved Oneonta and I loved admissions counselors. Karen Brown, I loved her. Um, she was amazing. Um, after that, I never wore a shirt and tie in, for the rest of my career. Um, I think that I went to startup culture very, very early on. Um, after, after my internship, I joined a company um, which was kind of corporate, corporate culture. It was an agency and it was a little bit more corporate culture than the rest of the agencies. Um, so I wore maybe like a button down and khakis some days there. Um, but then really after that, my, my clothing, has got, as you can tell, like, that's what I wear. Um, my clothing and, and the corporate culture of it all have really just dissipated. I, 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 there was nothing corporate about any of the jobs that I had um, after I took my first job in New York City at Movement Strategy. Um, and that's the best thing about it. I think that corporate culture, I, I'm having a hard time discussing this because I don't really know corporate culture that well because I've never been really exposed to it that much. Um, but for me, like startup culture is everything. You know, it's, it's, it's very flexible work styles. You, have, you, you, you tend to have um, bosses that care a little bit more about the employees. I mean, that's just a generalization, but um, all my bosses are a little bit younger um, and they treat you more like a human being. 
Um, then in corporate culture, they know your name, they know your face, um, they give you the credit that you deserve. Um, we wear whatever we want to the office. We're very comfortable. Uh, the work-life balance is incredible at startups. Um, so, you know, when you say you're going in to a for a nine to five, you know, if you're leaving Manhattan, like me, I don't, I don't live in New York City, um, but I commute to New York City. I've been commuting to New York City for seven years. Um, and when I say I'm leaving the office at 4.30, I'm leaving the office at 4.30. Um, and nobody questions that because you get your work done all the time. Um, there's also other perks. I mean, at WeWork, um, we had beer on tap. So I don't know if anybody's into that. I mean, I, I love beer, so I love that. Um, at Spotify, we have five cafeterias, beer on tap, um, a lot of snacks um, and things like that. I just don't think those are a lot of things that you find necessarily at corporate culture. Um, we have dogs coming into the office, you know, pets, you know, take your kid to work day, things like that, um, which are really, really exciting. Um, Spotify is like, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Internship with, with Google, um, but Spotify is a lot like that. Um, it's, it's very much just an innovative company um, that goes, that's very, very anti-corporate culture. Um, and it's also built into the culture. Spotify is a Swedish company and human resources in Sweden is a little bit more lax, um, but a little bit more, um, I guess, caring about the employee. Spotify also just released work from anywhere, which is exciting for, for us as professionals. Um, it's brand new. And it, it means that we could literally work from anywhere in the United States. Um, and in some cases, Mexico, Brazil, if that gets approved um, and still get paid in New York City salary, which is great. So that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, me and my wife were thinking about moving upstate a little bit further um, and taking advantage of that as well. So um, yeah, I, I think corporate culture and startup culture are, are, are literally night and day. It, they can't even be compared. Um, cool, does that answer your question about corporate culture? Or do you have any other questions there? Yeah, and I should have just said culture. I was curious what the you know, work culture was like. And I think that you're, you're answering it. Yeah, open, then, open workspaces, um, open floor planning, uh, planning. Um, no, really no hierarchy. There's hierarchy on paper, but Spotify likes to say that everybody's on the same level. Um, so that's another thing too, if you're, if you're looking to think about like how it is at Spotify, um, no matter where you are in the company, your idea will be heard if you want it to be. So um, that's just how Spotify is. I know it's a tough place to get in though. We've had students uh, apply for internships and it's quite a process too with a video and then of course an interview um so the the last question that i'd ask too is more a little bit detailed about technical skills that you're looking for when you're hiring for your department in particular and and what level do you hire you know how many years of experience is there an entry level do you have internships for the first time um we just hired a Paid. So all of our, all of our, all my reports are specialists. Um, and for the first time we hired a level below a specialist, which is a coordinator. That's the first time we've ever done that. Um, specialists are two years experience within Facebook advertising, at least. Um, coordinators are one year experience, maybe even entry level. Um, I think we look for somebody, like I said, who's pretty desirable, like pretty hungry um, to learn Facebook ads. And it would be great if you had some experience somewhere else before Spotify, um, but that's ne that not necessarily disqualifies you from getting a job at Spotify on my team. Um, just so you guys know, I mean, I look through thousands of, I look through thousands of resumes, literally. Um, and I do it, like I do it. Another member of my team does it. We look through all of them. Um, there isn't a resume that goes unnoticed at Spotify. Like we literally read every single resume. Um, and there are people, you know, one person who just got hired for the coordinator position um, only had six months experience with paid social. So we liked her a lot. She was from Albany, um, which was fun because my, my team is from upstate New York, which is great. Um, and we thought that she was fantastic. She, we just had a great personality and we thought she was really hungry. Um, she doesn't have the experience that we would usually hire for but she's in a way better because her mind could be molded to the way that Spotify does paid social. Um, whereas if you're coming from paid social with a year or two experience, you may have one way of doing it. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to say that like, you know, we look at all resumes. If you don't have, you know, a full year of experience, that's okay. Um, but some experience is usually better than none. Great, thank you. For sure. 
question. Um, so when you were um, just like, I guess, shadowing um, the SEO person, how did you make yourself super marketable that like all these job opportunities um, came in? <laughs> That's a great question. He helped. He helped me with that. So um, his name was Chad. He was amazing. Um, and he taught me a lot. He was already at the best at the top of his industry. Um, and I was just graduate. I just graduated college. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. He was already at the top. I found him in a bar, honestly. Um, and we hit it off and, um, I begged him to just take me in after he taught me as much as he could, like in a month and a half, I started applying to jobs using the buzzwords needed to get a foot in the door. Um, and he helped me write my resume, helped me write my cover letter. Um, and I was scared because I went in there and I was just like, there's no way I'm qualified. Like there's, there's no way, like, you know, I've only learned from you for like a month and a half. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and he assured me that I was, he's like, I literally taught you, I'm the best. He's like, I'm telling you, I'm the best. And I taught you everything. Um, so when I went in, um, for the, when I went in for the interview, um, he was right. I just knew every, everything they asked me, I knew. Um, and I knew how to do. And I actually took a job. My first job was internet marketing uh, strategy outside of New York City. That was my first one outside of New York City. Everything was New York City after that. Um, but that one, I came in. There is people who were there for two or three years, and I came in already at a, at a more advanced point than they were, for sure, um, all because of that mentor that I had. So, um, yeah, learn to speak the language, um, I guess, is a good one for your resume, and make sure you have some help um, with somebody who, who really knows what they're doing in the industry. Um, and that, it was, it was pretty, after that, it was, it was I'm not going to say easy, um, because that's not the right word, but it was definitely, I felt like I was going to get every job that I interviewed for, um, which was great. Thank you. Great question. Anybody else? Nancy, any more questions from you? I feel like I do. <laughs> yeah, well, I do. I'm, I have a million questions, but Daniel Taylor here put one in the chat. It says, as someone who wants to work in digital marketing in the music industry, are there any online courses or resources you'd recommend to learn more about the field? I mean, Facebook's got everything. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> um, Facebook has what's called Blueprint. Um, you could start there. There's definitely a lot a lot there. Um, I was going to just tout my own. I'm getting ready to start a course on Facebook ads um, really, really soon. So that was a timely, timely question. Hmm. Um, that's going to, it's probably going to be released in the next month or two. Um, but I really, really think it'd be helpful to get your foot in the door there. Um, but in, for the time being, I'll, I'll definitely give some props to other guys who I think do it really, really well. John Bloomer has been around longer than I have. Uh, his name is John Loomer, J-O-N Loomer. Um, he is very, 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 very good at paid social. Um, and he really makes it easy to understand. Um, so he's a great guy. Things like social media examiner is another one. Um, so some media marketing world, that's another one. Um, and of course, like Gary Vaynerchuk, um, like VaynerMedia, their insights and analysis are, are definitely a good place to start as well. Um, but again, if you if you want more, and if you're hungry, oh, sorry, I have to say the most valuable resource is definitely Facebook groups as well. Um, there's a lot of Facebook ads groups, um, one led by Kat Howell, who is, who is pretty good as well. Um, so Kat Howell, she's, she's amazing. Definitely join her group on Facebook ads. And there's a really, really big community of people who want to help there. So if you're looking for, sorry, if you're looking for more general, like digital marketing, HubSpot is another one um, where you want to be. What's the course you're teaching? It's how to run Facebook ads at a New York City agency. And if you need any testers, I'm sure we would have <laughs> some students who beta test it for you. Of course, of course. Yeah, the, uh, the content, it's, we're still about a month or two away um, with the content being completed, but I will definitely uh, reach out for some testers. I'm gonna need testers for sure. Um, so I'll definitely reach out when that, when that course is updated. So when you were, I'm sorry, Ben, if you don't mind if I'm asking questions, when you were talking about uh, target audiences, what if you don't know your target audience? You know, how do you, how do you find what, who your target audience is? Great question. And I'm going to throw one back at you. In this scenario, do you have conversion data? Like, do you know 
do you have any list of customers at all? So for instance, if you are a, I don't know, if you're some business um, and you've been around for a long time and you have maybe emails or phone numbers of your customers, um, that'd be great because if you do have that, that could be sourced for a lookalike audience, as you said. Um, so you may not know your, your target audience, but if you do have customer data, like emails or phone numbers, um, either would work. You could upload that to Facebook and Facebook would build a lookalike audience from those users. So it'll find, it'll find out who were similar interests as well. Is that ethical? I can, can I do that? <laughs> ethical, you can. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely ethical. I mean, you want to make sure you, when customers give you their information, um, if they're giving you their information and then you're obviously collecting it with some sort of privacy policy as well. Um, I don't think you should just go around and ask customers for their emails without anything, without them knowing why you're getting it. Um, but if you do have a privacy policy that says you're collecting emails, um, then that is ethical. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the, the whole, the target audience and, and really, you know, sort of what you were talking about, Abby, is that you know, do I just want to be on here as, you know, connecting with my fans or am I going to go the route of trying to find all these other people who would connect with me that I haven't connected with, but at the same time, I don't want to alienate my fans by seeing that ad in the stream. And, you know, Facebook has, I mean, their algorithm is constantly changing. I'm in a social media group where people are talking about, even when they're doing events, how that has changed of what they can and cannot do. Yeah, I mean, I think Facebook's always changing and that's, and that is, you know, the evolution of Facebook ads is in response to its users um, and the privacy policies or the privacy that they're breaching. Um, so I think that like the things that you can do before that you can't, you can, that you can't do now um, are in response to them getting dinged and getting fined and sued um, for, for those things as well. So I totally, totally agree there. Um, the one thing that's not super controversial is a Facebook pixel. Um, that's huh. Facebook's tool. Um, that's how it tracks all the users that go to its website. It's a pretty much an eyeball for your website. Um, and it, a spy for your website, if you will, on Facebook. Um, and it tells Facebook who's going to your website. So if you don't know your fans, right? Like if you don't know your target audience, um, Facebook pixel is there to help you to help it, you know, get smarter about who it's going after. Um, it uses several signals to, to, even if you just run a broad campaign with no layered on targeting um, to your website, Facebook will get smarter over time at who it's supposed to target because of the people that are actually clicking on those links and going to your website. So not having a target audience is okay. Um, it might cost you a little bit more upfront to test who's the right target audience, but Facebook will figure it out for you for sure. Yeah, so I just go back to this uh, nonprofit that I run. I don't even know if we have a Facebook pixel on our website. I mean, we don't do any <laughs> data analytic. Everybody just sort of comes to us and I go to them, but for the most part, they come to us. We're talking, Abby's in my record labels and popular culture class. And we're talking about the lack of data analytics that we actually are teaching in the classroom. And I can see the real benefit of a digital, broader digital marketing course that we need to be teaching, which you know touches on Facebook pixels, Facebook Blueprint, YouTube, the, every, even Spotify has a great backend course that people could take, you know, to learn how to use these platforms better. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's, that's totally true. And, you know, Facebook tries to be transparent with it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's Facebook, right? I mean, whether you're a small business or big business, the idea is to get you to spend money um, on their platform. That's why the courses are there. You, you feel empowered. You feel like you know more about how to spend money on Facebook. But at the end of the day, you're spending money. Um, and Facebook's there to take that money. Um, so like try to learn as much as you can about Facebook. I think that's kind of where I, where I, where I tried to make this course. You know, I, I, I tried to say like, this is what you need to know about Facebook. This is how Facebook makes its money. This is how Facebook makes the most money. Um, and this is how you can get smart about it type of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, Facebook, if you're, if you're on Facebook and you're gonna advertise, Facebook's there to take the most money from you as possible if you don't know what you're doing. So what are the pitfalls? of advertising on Facebook? Clicks are bad, are very bad on Facebook. Um, click campaigns, um, don't run them. If I were you, just don't run them at all. Um, a lot of mistaken clicks happen. Um, bot clicks happen. Um, I don't even know why Facebook has it as a website objective. I gotta be honest, I called on Facebook for that as well. 
Um, it's a pretty bad objective and it doesn't get you conversions. People think that if you drive more clicks to your website, that means more conversions, but Facebook actually has a conversions objective. Um, so there's really no reason to have a clicks objective. You just need the Facebook pixel for that. That's a big one. Um, money on a clicks campaign or a reach campaign, anything that's not conversions, the money goes by really, 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 really fast. Um, I'm talking, you know, if you have $5 a day, you could spend $5 in like 10 minutes um, on Facebook ads. So again, like with those campaigns, um, it's optimized for, an, they call it an optimized impression. So an optimized cost per 1000 impressions um, is their is Facebook's business model and, and how they run ads. Um, but if you're running anything outside of conversions campaign, it's cost per click, cost per video view, cost per reach, you know, CPM, things like that. Um, and those are the real burners of your cash. So stay away from those for sure. What other pitfalls are there? There's, um, yeah, I mean, there's tons of pitfalls. If you, if there's just a lot of pitfalls. It's Facebook ads. You know, Facebook is not that necessarily an ethical company. Um, so there's, there's definitely tons of pitfalls there. What would you say is a conservative budget that someone could use to test out? Because you want to test out everything, right? You probably test out your ads all the time of what's connecting with people. So how do you set that up so that you're not just losing money? Yeah, it depends on several things. It depends on your vertical. Um, it depends on your price point. So what you're offering and how much it sells for. Um, and it also depends on whether or not you want to do it in a statistically significant way. So what that means is if you run an A-B test on Facebook and you want to be fully conclusive about how, let's just, let's just narrow it down here. You have two different creatives. One's a picture of a cat, one's a picture of a dog. You're a pet co, maybe. Um, you want to know whether or not this cat picture drives more sales or this dog picture drives more sales. Um, let's say your price point is $5, $2.50, whatever it is. You need to have enough conversions for that test to be statistically significant. What that means is you just need to be have enough conversions to know that this is 100% accurate in every single case moving forward. Um, and people test without knowing that. Um, Seasonality is another pitfall on Facebook because if you run a test for a week in a non-statistically significant environment, that means a non-AB test, um, the day of the week could play a factor um, and you can take those results. And a lot of people make decisions off these data points, right? They'll run, they'll run like a one week test on their own in a live environment and say, okay, this cat picture spent $1,000 and has tons of sales. This dog picture spent $50. Um, and has a good cost per sale, but not as many sales. People would look at the cat picture and say that's the winner, but it's not, that's not the winner at all. Um, the, the data skewed there and it's not fair at all. Um, but the issue there, is that, that's another major pitfall that Facebook doesn't talk about enough. Um, people like companies around the world and not just us, not like people, not just people like us, right? Not like average people like us, like companies around the world, like the Netflixes of the world, the Airbnbs, you know, even Instagram, whatever, whoever's running ads, um, they take those, data points as Bible, right? They'll still say, this is it. This is the winner. Like we need to run more cat pictures when that test is flawed from the get-go. Um, so I think that's another pitfall that you need to understand. But getting back to your question, um, it all depends on your price point. It all depends on what vertical you're in. Um, and it all depends on whether or not you want to want an A-B test. Um, if you want to just get started with Facebook ads and see how much data you get in, um, if you're running a, I don't know, if you're running a product that's $1, um, you need at least 50 conversions uh, per week per ad set. Um, now we're getting really technical, but you asked the question, so now I'm opening it up. Um, you need 50 conversions per week per ad set for Facebook to learn who the best user is for your uh, product. Um, they could have less, they could have more, it doesn't matter, but you need to be around there. So backing that out to a price point and your cost per conversion, that'll help you calculate how much you need uh, to spend per day. We also have like, there's a formula, there's formulas for that as well. Just make it very easy for you guys. There's formulas for that as well online. And that could calculate if you want to get like 20 conversions per day, it'll calculate, you know, you tell them how much it costs per sale. And it'll calculate how many clicks you need, how many landing page views you need, how many add to carts you need um, at a certain conversion rate to get um, your total spend. So let's say Abby has an artist that has a release coming out on July 1st but she wants to test. So, you know, how far back should she be testing before she like throws out the big guns of money? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'd say you, 
again, it depends on your budget because you need a certain amount of conversions for it to be stat SIG. Um, but I think that a month would be a good start out. Um, if you were running a month, if you were July 1st, I'd think June 1st is a good place to start running a test for at least two weeks. Um, get all the inputs you can. Um, the one thing I will say is like always retest your hypothesis. Um, getting back to the Petco example, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to Abby's example of, of, of an artist. Um, well, what would you be testing? Would you be testing two artists in a record label against each other? Or what would you be testing in this scenario? Maybe two different songs, you know, just okay. try to Perfect. figure out what's going to connect with people to make them buy whatever Perfect. is being sold. So, so you're running an A-B test with two different songs. This is a perfect example. Um, week one, I would go ahead and run it. Just go ahead and maybe just put, maybe put a hundred bucks. Um, your KPI there would be streams, I guess, if you could measure that. Um, so put 50 bucks on it. Um, let 25, 25 for sell A, sell B. Um, see how many conversions you get, how many streams you get uh, per each song. Um, let it run for a week. After the first week, get the results, run it again, run the same exact test for another week um, and make sure it's correct. Um, and then I think you could go ahead and say like, that's your winner, whatever the winner is. Um, you can roll that out for July 1st. But again, you need a lot of conversions to make sure that everything is um, stat sig. We've got a few minutes left here if anyone has any, um, any questions that they still would like to ask uh, Efren before we wrap up. Michael, you got your hand up. Go for it. Hi. Uh, hey. th this should be an, a quick question. I have class in like three minutes, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I am I started at this internship and I have this task for um, Spotify and I have to like contact like Spotify curators and, and like can you just please tell me what is a Spotify curator <laughs> and like how do I find them on Spotify? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. They are literally, they are, the Spotify curators are the mysterious people at Spotify and they, it, they're very hard to find and for good purpose. Everybody wants their sound, their, their song on a Spotify playlist. Mm -hmm. um, the curators are the ones who make Spotify own playlists. Um, everybody wants to know who they are. Everybody wants to buy them a drink. Um, they are very, very popular, um, but nobody at Spotify knows who they are. It's for good reason. Um, I think I know one of them. I can't honestly in good faith give you his name, um, but you should look for somebody in editorial um, who writes about a specific genre of the artist that you're looking to um, get seen or heard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and somebody with more years of experience than one at Spotify um, in that industry as well. Sometimes there's curators on Spotify. If you go on LinkedIn, there are curators who actually list themselves as curators on Spotify. Okay. Uh, you can start there as well um, and just give them a heads up. Just know um, they get tons of requests. Um, and often, just very, very often, they people they remove their titles so it changes a lot so um they also have mysterious titles it's all for good reason it's on purpose um at spotify as well but you can start there and see if there's any curators you could find who are brave enough yeah thank you so much that was so helpful <laughs> of course of course all right i have to go to class so bye everyone have fun <laughs> Does anyone else that's uh, still on the call have any questions for Ephraim? All righty. Well, um, Ephraim, if it's if you would be um, okay with it, with um, if if students want to reach out to you, is there an email address that you'd be willing to share with this group? Sure. It's um, my name, Ephraim U W at Gmail. I'll just put it in the chat. Cool. Thank you. And also uh, LinkedIn is also um, a very good place to connect. So I'm very open to connecting on LinkedIn. Great. Thank you. Yep. And there it is in the chat. Um, perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I won't compare it to the mixing board to management we had about a month ago with an alumni who works at Pandora, but no. <laughs> I, I know. I know, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
we're actually we're actually uh, we've been connecting ever since. So I think I'm going to speak. He hosts panels that I'm going to speak on as well there. So it looks good. Oh, cool! And the Red Dragon Network is everywhere. Yes, it's awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, seriously, thank you, thank you for taking time out of your day. Uh, this has been um, hugely interesting, and I'm sure um, Abigail and Luke and, and the rest of our students are walking away with a lot of great information. Thank you for sharing your um, your email address and and the advice about connecting on LinkedIn as well. Um, there, uh, for the students, there will be more campus to career and mixing board to management programs in the future. So keep your eyes and ears out. Um, the uh, we we do have uh, not just as you can see music industry majors, but um, all different uh, walks of <laughs> academic academia um, in and around the music industry. So um, thanks, Ephraim. Any um, not to put you on the spot, but any uh, closing words for our students? Use alumni. Alumni are great. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Honestly, um, I love Oneonta. Um, I don't live there, but I just bought a home there as well, a second home there. So, which is which is great. I, I love it, and I'm definitely definitely down to help everybody. So, please reach out with any questions you may have. Fran, you bought a house in Oneonta. I bought a Airbnb in Oneonta. Yes. Oh, okay, so you're gonna rent it. I'm renting it out. Yeah, I'm actually renting it out right now, um, but I'm going to be living there for, for a couple months at a time. So um, the first year I'm going to rent it out, but after that, I'll be living there for a couple years, a couple months at a time. All right, well, I'm happy to have you in my classes when we're back face to face. And then Ben, are we going to go back to New York, do you think, in the fall? I, I hope so. We're, we're all hoping that um, all of our campus to career programs, including mixing board to management, will um, include a travel component. Um, I, I think we actually see it as now being this hybrid model where we'll do some face-to-face, -face, but then also we don't want to exclude our graduates in the music industry who are in Houston or Nashville or Los Angeles um, who can't be a part of that in person. So um, I think we're going to do both. Uh, you know, obviously right now we're um, uh, we're needing to meet the guidelines and, and the rules set by the state and, and all of that. But as soon as we can, um, yeah, yeah, getting back to the city is, is something we're going to very much want to do. Well, your friend, if you're in the area, I think my number's on my email. Don't hesitate to, to call. And then I think, too, I mentioned Laura Burkhart. So she's a SUNY Oneonta grad. Yep. She used to be a recruiter in ad yep. sales. That's right. And now she's that. over at TikTok. Gotcha. Yeah, that's right. I know the name. Um, I don't know her, but I definitely know the name. I've seen that quite a few times. But yeah, good to know. I did not know she was from Oneonta as well. Did not know uh -huh. But good to know. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, if you're, if you're in New York, happy to uh, host you at the office as well. Um, it's a pretty big office, so you guys can come check it out. Um, anybody, that goes for anyone, not just you guys, but anybody on this call, if you're ever in New York City um, and want a tour of the office, I could, when COVID, eh is over. Um, but if you want to tour the office, I'm happy to host you. Um, we could have some coffee and chat. We will uh, more than likely be taking you up on that offer. <laughs> Excellent. I hope you would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will. I'll pat, uh, and I'll pass that along to our alumni engagement staff as well. So we'll keep that on our list. Um, well, thank you. Thank you again, Ephraim. Thank you, everyone who uh, was here today. Um, and uh, with that, I'm, I'll close this out and thanks and hope you all have a great rest of the uh, Thursday. Awesome. Thanks guys. Good to see bye you. Bye. Thanks a lot bye. Ben, for hosting. Oh, sure. Take care everyone. Bye.